Next up on the Cosmic News Network, first contact with Joshua Pert. Good morning, Earthlings. Good. How you doing morning, today? Good. How you doing today? Welcome morning, to First Earthlings. Contact Radio. Thank you for today. Welcome to First Contact Radio. To talk about all these things we're talking about is because in life, everything is energy. Every single thing that's out there. Yo, it's First Contact with Joshua Pert. He's a man on the mic, just in case you didn't know it. Covering news from all around the globe, from the weather and space. Good morning, Earthlings. How you doing today? Welcome back to First Contact Radio. Today is the 16th, so we could see that we have a single sign there, Scorpio. That is our moon sign for today, and our sun sign is Aries. So we have Aries and Scorpio. Aries is a fire sign. Scorpio is a water sign. So just think how these two work together. The conscious mind has these ideas, and there's the emotions taking place underneath the surface, bubbling to the surface. So when we have fire and we have water working together, they can work nicely and work in good balance. The fire could create steam, or the fire could dissipate the water altogether, or the water could put the fire out. In other words, emotions can squash the ideas, or too many ideas could overwhelm the emotions. So if you look at it from that perspective, it will help you to understand a little bit more of what these energies are about. As far as trines or squares, we have several trines today. These are all between the moon sign Scorpio, and the first one here is between Venus, which is imagination, creativity. We have Jupiter, which is expansion. So between those two, uh, taking place this morning, we have an expansion of these emotional energies. We have a ability to use our imagination, so to use these energies, these emotions, find a way to employ our imagination to uh, look at them from different perspectives, perhaps, see how we could use them to our favor. So these are some nice, good things. Trines are always good, positive aspects, so expect your emotional feel to be expanded and maybe receive some creative ideas from them. If we go over to our numerology for today, we're at the number nine. Here's how we arrived at the number nine. Okay, we have the four. One plus the six is the seven, and then the year, 2014. It's also a seven altogether. It's an 18. One plus eight is nine. The process is called Theosophic subtraction, reducing down to a single number. Here's number nine, is the card associated with the hermit, or the astrological sign of a Virgo. It has to do with analysis, analyzing what is going on within. The hermit's also the healer, holds up the lantern high for others to see. Here's the path of the card representing the hermit. Right here, holding the lantern up because the hermit has gone and learned some lessons and now is going to share this wisdom with the others. Okay, so one thing also implied with this is the idea of patience, patience and timing. Patience and timing, very important in life. We need to be patient once we put things out for them to come back according to the correct timing. We often want to rush things. It's not necessarily the best way to go. If we could see on our tree of life here where the symbol is okay we look right over here here's hermit going from mercy to the center to beauty okay this side of the tree is the side that is the side of like humility mercy or is this is more of the masculine qualities severity understanding splendor and so on both sides of the tree, you have masculine qualities and feminine qualities. So there's a balance going on on each side. And then in the bigger picture, you have the balance between the three. And the idea is always trying to get back to the middle. 
So the hermit's going to use the patience to go from mercy, humility, coming back to the place of beauty. So it gets in balance. Patience and timing are very important in there. Taking the lessons of humility, bringing them forth, the idea of understanding how that applies into the beauty. And then, of course, we see where our Aries is, going from wisdom down to beauty. And the moon sign for today, Scorpio, we see down here, which is coming from this side as well. So we've got all our paths coming from this side of the tree today. Okay, so we could see kind of the balance that we're on. We're leaning to this side here, and we want to find our balance. Okay, so just helps you to give a focal point of where you want to go. They're all three heading to the same direction. Aries, Scorpio, Hermit. Place of beauty is where everyone's heading. All right, our current moon phase is 98% full. It's waning, which means it's going down. The right, moon was certainly large last night, wasn't it? Nice, nice large moon out there. The sky says the waning gibbonous moon rises soon after dark with Saturn hanging out close by. Watch them cross the sky together for the rest of the night. The moon occults or covers Saturn for South America. All right, then the Mayan Oracle today is a 12-tone day. We're getting ready to make the jump. Tomorrow will be the cosmic day or the jumping day where we go on to another wave spell. So we're wrapping up this theme of synchronicity and navigation. Today this is about beauty, shining bright, shining bright the beauty within us. And this actually does mean shining our beauty forward. And the last thing I showed you on the tree of life, where all three of those paths were working towards the place of beauty, right in the heart. So there is some synchronicity going on. I dedicate in order to beautify universalizing art. I seal the store of elegance with the crystal tone of cooperation. I am guided by the power of universal fire. And we could see where our position is here. Right here. And we could see that it's a galactic activation portal day. It's in synchronicity with this path over here. There's this side, and this side is a balance. All right. Moving on to the space weather today. Solar wind is low. 297.9 kilometers per second. Planetary K index is in the 1 to 3 quiet range. Nothing much in corona holes. This one's just going to pass on by, it looks like. Not facing us. We have a M class flare possibilities at 50, X at 5, and geomagnetic storm activity has dropped pretty low. 25% in the next 24 hours. Might have some effect coming through, but other than that, Things are quiet today. Over on the Jewish calendar, today would be 16 Nisan. It is the second day of Passover. All right, so let's see where we're at. And that is the energy. That's what we're dealing with today. So kind of take all of that, put it together in any way that makes sense to you. And just remember, you know, when we go into the world, if we have an idea of what we're working with, it helps us to move through the world a little bit better. Sometimes we just get up and go, and don't you find that on those days when you just get up and go and not really take the time to get your bearings, things are a little bit touch and go for a while until you kind of put your feet down, ground yourself on what's what, where you're at for that moment. And so it's a good idea. Just take a look and see what are the energies you're dealing with. It will certainly help you in advance to know situations you may be going in, other ways in which people may be responding. And that way it helps you so that when you are with others that are responding in certain ways or acting in certain ways, you can often put together to see why it is. And it makes more sense and it helps you to just be more aware then of how you can be effective in the world. All right, UFO News is up next. Here we go. This is the UFO News with Joshua Poet. All right, Dirk. Thank you very much. First sighting here takes us up to the space station. And what we have here is a UFO recorded from the space station seen entering 
Earth. It's not the first time, and it won't be the last. Okay. So here's another image close up. UFO was recorded by Street Cap One of YouTube, and he noticed it on the live ISS internet cam and recorded it. The UFO is moving towards Earth, entering Earth's atmosphere and disappearing within it. Very nice catch. Okay, here it is down yonder. Okay, so it's a good shot again. These are images everyone can capture if you just take the time, like Street Cap One does, to watch what's going on with the ISS. Okay, let me move from there on to our next story. This one here is a daytime UFO filmed over the Netherlands. Let's see the object in question. Mr. Smits, a resident of Maas Lewis, Netherlands, shot this great UFO video. He said the UFO was silent and eventually disappeared into the cloud. Mr. Smits is keeping his options open, saying that it could be a genuine UFO or a possible drone. And certainly in this day and age, with all the drones that we hear are in the sky, it's quite possible. Okay. So there you go. This is the sighting in the Netherlands. Okay. Next, we're going to go over to this is a young woman from a small north Pembrokeshire village believes she had a close encounter early Tuesday morning. Elsa Neal from Wallace near Woodstock was standing outside her home at around 6.45 a.m. when she saw an unidentified flying object hovering over a large tree near the bottom of her garden. I ran inside the house. I got my phone, but there wasn't enough battery left to film it. But there was enough to take pictures, so I started snapping away. Else, 26, or at least, uh, described the UFO as being the size of a car and was spinning around like a topper. She said, as I watched it, it split into two places, then it went back into one. It shot off into the sky in the blink of an eye. It just went up, and I couldn't see it anymore. She says, I'm sounding as if I'm crazy, but I'm just a normal girl living in the country. My heart is still in my mouth. One of these days, we won't have to have disclaimers for people who see things, because we'll just know that people see things, and it doesn't mean they're crazy. Okay, Phil Schneider, remember him? He claims to have seen extraterrestrials and actually got into a fight with some of them. Here's Phil Schneider talks about alien base under Los Alamos Lab, New Mexico. This is one of those digging machines they use for building, digging those tunnels. Phil Schneider was a former U.S. government geologist and engineer who was involved in producing the underground explosions which were required to facilitate the buildings of various underground military bases as well as submarine bases for the United States government. He was the only person to survive the infamous alien-human war at Dulce in Los Alamos where 66 government agents and workers lost their lives in August of 1979. For the last two years of his life, he gave lectures about classified information, including UFOs to the media and to the general public. Phil Schneider was found dead in his apartment on January 7, 1969. He was murdered just like his UFO research partner a few years earlier, and all documents, photos, and videos he had in his possession, which he was about to use for a massive disclosure were gone. Okay, now here's a nice good video. Phil talking about his experience. Okay, so I'm going to leave that for you to check out. One thing I always find interesting about the Phil Schneider story is every time I hear it, there's only one thing that sticks out. He shot first. And we can't really then decide after that if he was attacked or if they were just defending themselves because every story I've heard, he struck first. And so 
you know, it's hard. It kind of throws mud into the water. It's hard to say that the aliens were the aggressive ones here. At least that's the way I see it. Maybe I'm wrong. If I am, let me know. I am willing to look at things from other perspectives. All right, here's a piece. It's a three-minute piece. It's it's called a documentary on Area 51. It's just though just video footage. However, it's some good footage. See, it's supposed to be from Dreamland out here, right? John Leonard Walston. This was sent to us from one of our one of our friends of the show. Pretty good sighting what's going on there. Is this military craft? Is this something from out of this world? I'm just going to skip on through a little bit. So it's a pretty cool looking ship. Whatever it is. Okay. And now from this about Area 51, here's a piece for you to watch. It's 44 minutes, 21 seconds in length. It's called the New Area 51, otherwise known as Area 52. This show investigates the Dugway Proving Grounds, a remote military testing facility near Dugway, Utah, and examines the report of UFO activity that has surrounded the site for the past 10 years, including some UFO watchers who dub it Area 52, the new Area 51. So there you have it. That's our UFO news for today. I'll be back momentarily, and we've got some more information and stories for you, so stay tuned. Come into our circle, great spirit. Fill our souls with peace.
So, today would be the second day of Passover. It is the second day. It wouldn't, not would be, it is. Um, here's a site that has some Passover weekly readings, and we'll get into this site another time. But I just wanted to show you, it's called Hebrew for Christians. Interesting site. This is Learn the Language of the Kingdom, and we'll dig into this another day. I just wanted to show you where I'm pulling this up from. And what it has is a weekly list of readings that are done during the Passover. So I've selected one of them today. We're going to go to Numbers, which is this one right here, ready to go. On the 14th day of the first month is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the month is a feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. On the first day shall, there shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, but offer a food offering, a burnt offering to the Lord, two bulls from the herd, one ram, and seven male lambs, a year old. See that they are without blemish. Also their grain offerings of fine flour mixed with oil. Three-tenths of an ephah shall you offer for a bull, and two-tenths for a ram. A tenth shall you offer for each of the seven lambs, also one male goat for a sin offering to make atonement for you. You shall offer these besides the burnt offerings of the morning, for which is a regular burnt offering. In the same way, you shall offer daily for seven days the food of a food offering with a blessed or pleasing aroma to the Lord. It shall be offered besides the regular burnt offering and its drink offering. And on the seventh day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall do no ordinary work. So just a little bit of... Uh, some of the traditions that were set forth in the Old Testament for what is going on with the. Let's see, maybe we can go ahead and uh, look at this other one here as well. Let's see here. Let's go back to the history here. find our way around here we go um, it's various well, let's take a look at this site as long as we're here how about that uh, Shalom and welcome for to Hebrew for Christians here you'll find basic information about the Hebrew alphabet vowels biblical Hebrew grammar and what you can do better to understand the scriptures from a Hebraic point of view join me in my Beth Midrash house of study and progress from not knowing a single letter of Hebrew to reading and speaking it with confidence in addition to learning Biblical Hebrew grammar, this site provides information about common Hebrew blessings, Jewish prayers, the Hebrew scriptures, Jewish holidays, the weekly Torah portions from a Messianic point of view, the Hebrew names of God as well as ordinary glossary of Hebrew and Yiddish terms is also provided. Be sure to check out the online store for some excellent study materials. There we go. Mysteries of the Hebrew Alphabet. Let's check this out here. These are all the Hebrew alphabet letters right here. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Galet, He, Va, Zayin, Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samet, Ayin, Pe, Zadi, Kof, Resh, Shin, Tav. Each one of these letters correlates to one of, there's 22 of them, correlates to one of the 22 major arcana of the tarot. Fool, Magician, High Priestess, this is Delet is the uh, Empress, Emperor, uh, High Priest, Lovers, Chariot, Strength, Hermit, Wheel, this is uh, Ahmed, uh, Justice, Mem, which is the Hangman, Noon, Death. Samek is the uh, is the higher self. It's uh, fourteen card number fourteen. I'm having a mind blank here. Let me look at the card itself. It's the card of temperance. Okay, a little. <laughs> then we got uh, devil, and we have a uh, tower. 
this would be the star, the moon, the sun, judgment, and the world. So all of these letters are represented. So if you are studying or want to understand the Hebrew alphabet, you can see how they connect by understanding how they play out in the 22 major arcana of the tarot. Okay. So the Hebrew word for the letter, the Hebrew word for the letter is at, which can mean sign and wonder. Each letter of the Hebrew alphabet then may contain signs that point to wonderful truths about life. According to Midrash, the Lord God himself taught the alphabet along with the numerical values, mathematical relationships, etc. for the letters. To Adam Harishon, who then transmitted the knowledge to his sons and then passed on to their sons and so on until it was taught to Jacob at the school of Shem in Salem. Jacob taught the secrets of the alphabet to Joseph, who used it to decipher dreams, etc. Jewish mystics go so far as to say that the entire cosmos was created from the 22 consonants of the Hebrew alphabet, called Otiat Yasod, or foundational letters. Through the Oit Yasod, God formed substance out of chaos and brought forth existence from non-existence. In other words, the entire universe is created and sustained by divine language, the word of God. When the Lord spoke the universe into existence, his words still echo throughout all the creation, sustaining it and preserving it in being. Rabbi Yoshea taught that when a human king builds a palace, he does not build it with his skill alone. The king employs a builder. Moreover, the builder does not bring it into his own imagination, but consults a blueprint, a plan, a diagram to know how to arrange the chambers, doors, passageways of the palace. In the same way, God is both king and builder, consulted Torah, and then created the world. Yeshua the Messiah is called the Devar Elohim, the word of God and the Elf and the Tav, who upholds all the created order by the word of his power. It is the Messiah Yeshua alone who is the true Yasad or foundation of life itself. Every holy utterance can be traced back to him, and he is the source of the origin of all that is good, lasting, and righteous. Indeed, Yeshua is called the Zohar of his glory, that is the radiance of the glory of God himself, who upholds all things by the word of his power. Since he is the first and the last, we can see that the Odiat will all reveal something about him. As various acoustics in scripture reveal, the Hebrew letters and their orders are of divine origin. The Hebrew language is unique in this regard, since you can learn something about God from the Hebrew letters themselves and their spiritual properties. For instance, some claim that the order of the letters within a word reveals spiritual properties. For example, if the letters appear in a word ascending order from Tav to Aleph, the word connotates compassion, moving toward Aleph, God, whereas if they appear in reversed or de descending order, the word connotates the idea of justice. An example of the former would be the name Yah, and of the letter of the word King. Other words are formed in triangular patterns, combinations of these attributes, etc. Okay, and then here it says, the following blessing may be recited, thanking the Lord for teaching your hand to write the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. alphabet. It is Baruch Hamlamad et Yadi bless appear et Hai Otiyat. Blessed is the one who has taught my hand to scribe the letters. There are a variety of Hebrew script styles used today, though the Hebrew script used for sacred writing is called Sta'em, an acronym for Sifri Torah, Torah Scrolls, Telfin, and Mizuat. Sta'em is written using the Kitav, Asheret, or Aramaic squared script according to a number of detailed rules on how each letter is to be formed. There are three basic types of Stam writing performed by Stam certified Jewish Sofrim scribes. And here we have three examples here. We have Ketav Yosef, a style of Hebrew script used by the Ashkenazi Jews. The source derives from the Gemara and Rabbi Yosef Karo, author of the Bet Yosef and Shuluk Arach. And then we have another style, which here, Ketavariz, 
is the Hebrew script used in accordance with the tradition of Rabbi Isaac Luria, also known as Zerio. In Egypt, most Chassidim used this script for their Sefiri Torah. It is notice it is identical to Ketav Yosef, except for the letters Aleph, Vav, Chet, Sadi, Sadi, Sofib, and Shin. They have slight modifications. And then here we have the style of script used by the Sephardic Jews. Okay, in each case of script style, however, there are many rules governing the formation of the letters so that there be no confusion between the letters written in sacred writings. Okay, and some books to pick up, but very interesting site. And again, learning these is not such a difficult thing. They correlate to the 22 major arcana of the tarot. So the tarot cards in themselves really carry a lot of wisdom because you can see that they relate to the tree of life. The tree of life is the symbol that is talked about within Kabbalistic systems. It is a system that incorporates numbers, colors, sounds, and certainly all of the lessons that we get from these Hebrew letters. So just by looking at the major arcana and understanding these letters, it helps you to understand what this represents and what they mean. And of course you can see that each of these letters has a number value to it. So one of the ways that the system works is when you put words together using these letters, you add up the words just like we do with the numerology when we're looking at the day. And you add up these words, and now every word has a numeric value. And the way in which a system of gematria would work is that you would take a word that had one numeric value, and you would swap it out for another word of the same numeric value. And that way, the scribes, those who were putting together information, could keep their wisdom secret, except to those who were initiated. That means they were in on the secret. They knew what this true meanings were. So they would see this and they would understand that by swapping out the words, one word that had the same number value as another word would have the same meaning. It would help them to understand. But if somebody was just reading it and didn't understand that, they wouldn't they wouldn't know it look any further. For example, uh, Messiah, Redeemer, and Serpent all have the same numeric value. Therefore, there was something about all three in which there was a common meaning. So something to dig deeper with than what we're originally told because we're thought that the snake, the serpent, is nowhere connected to the Redeemer or Messiah. But through the meanings here and the system of gematria, we learn otherwise. So it's just some things to consider. Check out this site. It's a pretty cool site. As you can see, lots of information here. And uh, we'll dig through it some more. Just a good brief introduction today and the prayer to get things started. and. Let's move on to our next subject. So today I thought we'd uh, bring up the subject of the Aztecs, who they were. You've heard all about them many, many times. Dig into the mysteries of Aztec history right here. What was ancient Aztec art and culture like? What about the Aztec religion and the legendary Aztec sacrifices? The Aztec Empire was peopled by a group that once was once nomadic, the Mexicans. The chronicles told them that after their long journey from Atlan, they found themselves to be outcasts until they found the sign sent to them by their god, Huitzilopochtli, Huitzil, and they began to build their city. And so the Mexican people continued and the Aztec Empire began. The city of Tenochtitlan was soon to become one of the largest cities in the world. The power of the Mexican people became more consolidated and they began to form alliances. Their military power grew as well and they began to conquer people in the surrounding areas. At the height of its power, the Aztec Empire was organized and strong, but ruled with fear. In 1519, a clash of cultures was to take place unlike anything before it. Although there was much tragedy in both Spanish and Aztec empires before this, the meeting of the two civilizations was disastrous. In a few short years, the culture and structure of one of the most historic history's greatest empires would have virtually vanished. Okay, little well, tidbits of information. Here we go. It was against the law to be drunk in public in the Aztec Empire unless you were over 70. Each Aztec home had a steam bath. 
and it's said that one major Aztec weapon could chop off the head of a horse with one blow. It's a pretty sharp weapon there. All right, so this is one site that has some information. You can go look at like the timeline of Aztec history. Time to take a look at the Aztec timeline to get an overview of what happened during the times of civilization. Collectively, the people of the allied Central Mexican and American city-states between the 12th century and the 15th century Spanish invasions are commonly referred to as the Aztec. The Aztec Empire was controlled primarily by a political body called the Triple Alliance made up of the Acholo people of Texoco, the Mexica in Tenochtitlan, the Dipantia people, the Tlilcopan. These three people and three cities were responsible for the dominion, domination of much of Mexico during the period we'll show in our Aztec timeline. The Aztec capital city was located in Tenochtitlan, which is the site of the modern Mexico City, and the empire covered nearly all of the current country of Mexico, extending down into other regions of Central America as well. Over time, Tenochtitlan became the primary city of the Triple Alliance, and the Mexica became the rulers of the emperor. Social stratification was significant, and religion played an important part in the spiritual and the political life of the people. The Aztec timeline includes the generally agreed upon dates of major events for the empire. For various reasons, experts dispute some dates, but this will give you an idea of the flow of events in the history of the empire up until its fall. And here we go, all the way from the 6th century, from the first Nautil-speaking peoples began to settle in Mexico. We can get the settlement, the travel, building an empire. 1350 is when that began, building of canals, causeways with canals, and that continued on all the way up until the famine in 1452 and 54. And then we had another rise of the empire, reign of the fifth king, Moctezuma I, who was also referred to as Montezuma I. This was in 1440. And then, of course, they have their floods. It took place in 1510, and then from 1517, we had the fall of their empire all the way down to 1525. Okay, so a lot to look at here. I'm going to jump on to another site. It says the Aztecs are probably originated as nomadic tribe in northern Mexico, arrived in Mexico, Mesoamerica around the beginning of the 13th century. From their magnificent city cap capital city, Tenochtitlan, the Aztecs emerged as a dominant force in central Mexico, organizing an intricate social, political, religious, and commercial organization that brought many of the region's city-states under the control by the 15th century. Invaders, led by Spanish conquistador Hernan Cortes, overthrew the Aztecs by force and captured Tenochtitlan in 1521, bring an end to Mesoamerica's last great native civilization. Okay. The exact origins of the Aztec people are uncertain, but they are believed to have begun as a northern tribe of hunter-gatherers whose name came from that of their homeland, Atlan, or White Land. The Aztecs were known as the Tenocha, from which the name of their capital city, Tenochtitlan, was derived, or the Mexica the origin of the name of the city that would replace Tenochtitlan, as well as the name for the entire country. The Aztecs appeared in Mesoamerica as the south-central region of pre-Columbian Mexico City is perhaps known in the earliest 13th century. Their arrival came just after, or perhaps, helping to bring about the fall of the pre -dom previously dominant Mesoamerica civilization, the Toltecs. Says the next. Aztec language, Nahuatl, was the dominant language in central Mexico by the mid-1350s. Numerous Nahuatl words borrowed by the Spanish were later absorbed into English as well, included chili or chili, avocado, chocolate, coyote, peyote, guacamole, ocelet, and mezcal. When the Aztecs saw an eagle perched on a cactus in the marshy land near the southwest border of Lake Texcoco, they took it as a sign to build their settlement there. 
They drained the swampy land, constructed artificial islands in which they could plant gardens, and established the foundations of their capital city, Tenochtitlan, in 1325 A.D. Typical Aztec crops were including maize, corn, along with beans, squash, potatoes, tomatoes, and avocados. They also supported themselves through fishing and hunting local animals such as rabbits, armadillos, snakes, coyotes, and wild turkey. Their relatively sophisticated system of agriculture, including intense cultivation of land and irrigation methods, and a powerful military tradition would enable the Aztecs to build a successful state and later an empire. It says here in 1428, under the, their leader, Itzcoatl, the Aztecs formed a three-way alliance with the Texocans and the Tucubans to defeat their most powerful rivals for influence in the region, the, P P the Pacanic, and, the, and conquer their capital of Azapotzacotl. Itzcoatl's successor, Montezuma, who took power in 1440, was a great warrior who was remembered as the father of the Aztec Empire. By the early 16th century, the Aztecs had come under the rule over 500 small states and some 5 to 6 million people, either by conquest or commerce. Tenochtitlan, as its height had more than 140,000 inhabitants, was the most densely populated city ever to exist in Mesoamerica. Bustling markets such as Tenochtitlan's Tetelaloco, visited by some 50,000 people on a major market days, drove the Aztec economy. The Aztec civilization was also highly developed socially, intellectually, and artistically. It was a highly structured society with a strict caste system. At the top were nobles, while at the bottom were serfs, indentured servants, and slaves. The Aztec faith shared many aspects with other Mesoamerican religions, like that of the Maya, notably including the rite of human sacrifice. The great cities of the Aztec Empire, magnificent temples, palaces, plazas, and statues embodied the civilization's unfailing devotion to the many Aztec gods, including Hitzilopochtli, the god of war and sun, and Quetzalcoatl, feathered serpent, a Toltec god who served as many important roles in the Aztec faith over the years. The Aztec calendar, common in much of Mesoamerica, was based on a solar calendar our solar cycle of 365 days, and a ritual cycle of 260 days. The calendar played a central role in the religion and rituals of the Aztec society. Okay, and one more. This is another site to check out. It's uh, Indians.org. It says the Aztecs, or Mexicas, were the Native American people who dominated northern Mexico at the time of the Spanish conquest led by Hernan Cortes, in the early 16th century. According to her own legends, they originated from a place called Atzlan, somewhere in the north or northwest Mexico. At that time, the Aztecs, who referred to themselves as the Mexica or the Tenocha, were a small, nomadic, nohotl speaking aggregation of tribal people living in the margins of civilized Mesoamerica. Sometimes in the 12th century, they embarked on a period of wandering, and in the 13th century, settled into the central basin of Mexico, continually dislodged with small city-states that fought one another in shifting alliances. The Aztecs found re finally found refuge on small islands in Lake Texaco Texcoco, where in 1325, they founded the town of Tenochtitlan, which is the modern-day Mexico City. The term Aztec, originally associated with the migrant Mexica, is today a collective term applied to all peoples linked by trade, custom, religion, and language of these founders. It says, fearless warriors are pragmatic builders. The Aztec Empire created an empire during the 15th century that was surpassed in size in the Americas only by that of the Incas in Peru. An early text in modern archaeology continued to reveal beyond their conquests and many of the religious practices there were many positive achievements, the formation of a highly specialized and stratified society, and an imperial administration, the expansion of a trading network as well as a tribute system, the development and the maintenance of a sophisticated agricultural economy, carefully adjusted to the land and the cultivation of an intellectual religious outlook that held society to be an integral part of the cosmos. Okay. It says the yearly round of rites and ceremonies in the cities of Tenochtitlan 
a neighboring Tetzazakoko and their symbolic art and agriculture gave expression to the ancient awareness of the interdependence of nature and humanity. The Aztecs remained the most extensively documented of all the American Indian civilizations at the time of European contact in the 16th century. Spanish friars, soldiers and historians and scholars, or Indian or mixed descent, left invaluable records of all aspects of life. These ethno-historic sources linked to modern archaeological inquiries and studies of ethnologists, linguists, historians, and other art historians portray the formation and flourishing of a complex imperial state. So there you go. There's a bunch of information about the Aztecs. The site you can go back and check so you can learn more about who they are if that's a particular interest to you. All right. Now we're going to go over to an article here having to deal with the effects of the moon. It says, did you feel the blood moon energy shift? In the early morning of April 15th, there was a blood moon that brought a distinct shift in energy. I fell asleep on the sofa around 11.30 p.m. the night before, and around 11, about 1.30 a.m., my seven-month-old German shepherd, Sammy, woke me up by rubbing his nose in my face. When I went to let him outside, the lunar eclipse was just beginning, so I grabbed my camera and took a bunch of photos of the blood moon. It says, according to Wiki, the color red arises because sunlight reaches the moon, must pass through a long and dense layer of the Earth's atmosphere, where it is scattered. Shorter wavelengths are more likely to be scattered by the air molecules and small particles, and so by the time the light had passed through the atmosphere, the longer wavelengths dominate. This resulting light we perceive as red. This is the same effect that causes sunsets and sunrises to turn the sky a reddish color, and an alternate way of considering the problem is to realize that as viewed from the moon, the sun would appear to be setting behind the earth. Such a total eclipse of the moon is sometimes referred as a blood moon. This is the photo that was taken said at 3.20 a.m. in, the, in uh, Siesta Key, Florida. So I made my post on the In5D Facebook page about how my dog woke me up just in time for the eclipse blood moon. Not by coincidence. Many other people woke around the same time to witness the event and the energies as if they were riding the same wave of energy. Many people acknowledge that a full moon has an effect on consciousness. Some people receive mental imbalances while they feel simply the energy of the full moon. In scientific terms, the moon passes through the energy's magnetotail three days before the full moon, and it takes about six days to cross and exit to the other side. During this period, there's an unusual shift of energies that occur and can play positive and negative roles on the human psyche, most likely depending on your mental state of well-being. In other words, if you are thinking positive, then these thoughts will be magnified. Conversely, the same is true for negative feelings and emotions. Psychological terms, our bodies are mainly comprised of water. We know the moon plays a larger role in the tides of the oceans. If the moon can affect the tide in such a manner as possible, it also has an effect on us as well. It says, right after the full moon eclipse, the moon tunes a pinkish, reddish, and orange kind of color depending on atmospheric conditions. The energies of many, that many people are feeling can literally be felt within your pulsating blood. As a result, you may feel more energized, creative, motivated, and productive in your everyday life. Conversely, during a new moon, many people feel grounded. All right, so there's some info on that. So how did you feel during the moon? I just I felt a good vibe of energy. I was out checking it out. And uh, it was just nice, calm, relaxing vibe that I was feeling. Nothing uh, intense. Just nice, calm, just enjoying looking up at the moon. All right, here's our message for today. It comes to us from Jesus. Jesus, you have enormous power, enormous capabilities. April 10th, 2014, by John Smallman. Jesus, time, as you experience it in the illusion, is accelerating. The reason for that is because more and more of you are focusing on the now moment which is quite free of the limitations that the construct of time imposes upon you. You are making your way into wakefulness, where time is no more, and as you do so it appears to be accelerating and taking you along with it. It's quite an adventure is it not? And of course it leads to the cessation of time altogether. You have a saying time is of the essence, 
and within the illusion that certainly seems to be the case as everyone is almost constantly running to keep up with themselves, to make deadlines, to attend meetings, and when occasionally you get left behind the world flows on unaware, and seemingly uncaringly. This is not a happy state because you then have to defer or cancel some of those things you were planning on doing, which at the time seemed incredibly important. It is depressing for you and can lead to a self-judgment that you are not good enough, strong enough, resourceful enough compared to others who seem to cope so well. Time is confusing, very confusing for you because it is so unstable, especially when you must rely on its stability. Your atomic clocks are incredibly precise in their measuring of its passing, but all they really measure is the frequency of their own energy fluctuations which is useful in a physical or scientific sense because very precise spatial relationships can be established between things. But time is what you experience as you wait for something to happen or to pass. It is purely experiential and, depending on the intensity and direction of your expectations, the same amount of measured time can seem long, short, or normal. That sensation is quite personal to you, individuated and separated as you are, and therefore confirms for you the reality of the illusion and your aloneness in a vast and uncaring universe, in which you are engaged in an unending struggle to survive. Here the concept of oneness makes absolutely no sense, is quite incomprehensible, another insane idea that is best ignored or discarded. Consequently nearly all of the mystics, masters, enlightened ones and we in the spiritual realms advise you to make a very determined effort to live in the now moment, the only moment that has real meaning, because everything that happens happens now. Despairing about the past or worrying about the future is an incredible and quite unnecessary drain on your energy. Yes, in the illusion it seems that intelligent, creative and highly motivated people can, as it were, move mountains. That is they build railroads, superhighways, space shuttles, weapons systems, etc., but alof these are illusory and will not last because within the illusion everything and there are no exceptions here decays, falls apart, and disintegrates. Focusing on the now moment is a spiritual exercise that helps you to clear your minds of extraneous distractions and draws you irresistibly towards your inevitable awakening, into your natural state as fully conscious beings whereupon all the limitations of the illusory world just fall away. As you each raise your level of consciousness, your awareness, through meditation, contemplation, or by focusing on that ever-present now moment, you find your physical needs becoming fewer and fewer. Along with that your peace and contentment grow proportionately, your remaining worries dissolve and you know that all is divinely taken care of, and therefore of course that you have absolutely nothing to worry about and that produces a most wonderfully stress-reducing and blood pressure-reducing state of alert relaxation. And your doctors and scientists do agree that meditation is good for you. So even if you do not seem to be achieving wonderful moments of clarity, enlightenment or some other highly sought illuminating and uplifting experience, do allow yourselves the time to meditate. Above all be patient with yourselves as you do so and ignore all the egoi distractions that tend to pour into your minds as you sit quietly doing nothing, reminding you of all the things you should be doing. It is your determined intent, an ability which will most definitely increase if you persist in meditating regularly, to ignore those distractions that brings you the benefits. And as you succeed in disregarding those distractions, space becomes available for you to hear your spiritual guidance, those intuitive hits that help you to resolve issues that had been troubling you. Success breeds success, and as you learn to resolve personal issues peacefully and gently your competence in all your fields of endeavor increases. You each have enormous power, enormous capabilities, you know that because there are all those self-help books out there confirming this. And you gain access to them through your meditative practice. The power and importance of a meditative practice can never be overemphasized simply because it is so powerful. When you are tired or dispirited it is often very tempting to give your meditation practice a miss, just for today you tell yourself. And you remind yourself of how unrewarding it has been for you on previous occasions when you attempted to meditate when you felt like that. However, even though it seems that you are getting no benefit, actually taking the time to sit, despite your reluctance and the expected ineffectiveness you experience while doing so is beneficial. At a deep level you do know this 
so disregard the complaints of your tired and anxious body and enter a meditative state, even if only for a few minutes, because this really does strengthen you. Many of you have at times given up your meditation practice altogether, and then maybe months or even years later you decided to take it up again, and the results were often quite startling as you obtained a forgotten sense of peace and relaxation that you had not enjoyed in a long time. So, if that is where you are, restart your practice right now, enjoy the benefits and allow love to flow abundantly through you once more as it will, healing you and those with whom you interact. That is why you are here now, to be a conduit to the planet and to all the life forms that she supports, through which God's love flows constantly and abundantly. Your loving brother, Jesus. All right, good, good message, good message indeed. So we're going to get to our meditation now to make use of exactly what I just talked about. Let's take a deep breath and exhale. Take another deep breath and exhale. And just breathe in and out. And as you do, just feel yourself connected to this moment, to the now moment. And as you connect to the now, you feel the energy flowing in and out. Feel the energy from the past and the future, all combining to this present moment of the now. And you realize this is the important moment where everything can be changed. In this moment we can adjust the way in which we've used the energy of the past and the way in which we're going to use it in the future. And all of that is decided here in the now. So just be here now in this moment. Feel your breathing now. Feel your heartbeat. Tune in to your senses and what you are experiencing this moment in the world around you. And as you experience these moments, just feel the love flowing through your being. And feel that right now this love exists all around you. And feel this love flowing through your being and send it out now from your heart chakra like a beam of light all around the world. And imagine others doing exactly the same thing. And know that we are all connecting right now in this moment of creating a vibration of love. Sending this love out and out to change the world through positive actions that we're doing. Think of those in your life near and dear to you and just imagine sending love to them. Think of those around you that you know that are troubled and dealing with issues of health or mental conditions or any other issues and just send them love and light that they might overcome their challenges. Let's think of the earth and all of the changes she is going through and let's send love into the earth right now so that the earth is nurtured in the way that we are nurtured by the earth. And just think of positive thought for the world. A positive thought for everyone in the world today and let that be enough. So let our conscious mind continue on that journey of feeding the ever-present now with positivity. And let's bring our conscious attention back to this present moment. Three, coming back to the present moment filled with confidence. Two, back to the present moment filled with faith. And one, back to the present moment. Happy, healthy, and whole. Happy, healthy, and whole. Take another deep breath, exhale, and open your eyes. That's it, my friends. That's our show for today.
Thanks again for being here. I'll be back tomorrow with more news and information. We'll continue on with our study of the Krivalian tomorrow. So if you haven't read through the previous lessons and you want to brush up, brush up because that's what we're doing. All right, that's it. I'll be back tomorrow. Keep loving each other. I'll talk to you soon. Peace. I'm out of here.